Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Jack Livingston from uh, Castle Technology, and I'm going to spend a few minutes um, with my non-existent colleague who is on his way, not here yet, uh, but he'll be here in a few minutes, uh, explaining um, a restructuring of um, Castle and what we intend to do for the future. Uh, I'm going to divide uh, the talk up into three sections. Uh, the first section is going to be on our Ionix PCs, tell you a little bit about um, the product range at the moment. Uh, I'd then like to go on and give a brief introduction onto uh, the new shared source uh, initiative. Um, and then Steve's going to um, take over and go through some of the more uh, intricate details of the, um, of the initiative. Um, and I'm sure you'll have lots of questions. Um, so we'll be very happy to um, take those questions and discuss some of the issues um, that I'm sure you all want to ask. So, um, I'll move on quickly uh, to just go through some of the uh, different um, uh, products that we do at the moment. Uh, our entry level machine is the Aria Q. Yeah, it's a very nice, neat little product. Um, it has room for one uh, CD or DVD device. Um, it actually has several, room for several hard drives, although we only fit one. Um, it has a standard Ionix uh, motherboard uh, with an FX5200 um, graphics card from NVIDIA. Um, choice of memory, choice of hard drives. Uh, starts at just £799, including VAT. Uh, and the top end machine, which has a DVD, 120 gigabytes of memory, and 512 uh, of, of um, sorry, 120 gigabytes of hard drive, and 512 of uh, DDR RAM is 899. Uh, it's a very cute, um, compact little uh, product. Uh, you can see all these, of course, on our stand. Um, for those of you who are more used to a uh, RISC PC style of uh, case, uh, the X100 here uh, is a very similar size, although a little bit deeper within a RISC PC. Uh, again, there's room for just one CD or DVD drive um, and room only for one hard drive. Uh, and uh, we do an entry level one that starts at 999. And the uh, DVD model um, comes in at 1099. Uh, but you do get, um, first of all, you get a floppy drive, which you don't get with the ARIA, and you also get a whole host of fun with software. Um, things like Writer, which is a word uh, reading document from uh, TechWriter uh, Stable, um, Fireworks, uh, Oregano 2, um, and uh, CDVD Burn uh, with the uh, top uh, Um, a few months ago we introduced the X300, which is very com again a compact case, slightly bigger. It is able to take two uh, CD devices. Uh, there's room for three hard drives inside and it comes as standard with a floppy drive mounted at the top. Um, it's got very easy access, the side slides off with just two thumb screws. Uh, again, the price is for the ATP version with 256 megabytes of memory, is 999, and the DVD model. The same step as before at 1099. Um, the classic Ionix um, is, has got uh, room for two uh, fiber reporting uh, CD type drives, uh, two external three and a half inch drives, so you've got a floppy drive there as well. Um, it's got, uh, also got room for um, podules uh, at the back, and so it's quite unique um, uh, as well. All of the uh, computers are fitted with USB 2, and two rear ports and two front ports, so you can add um, memory sticks, um, card readers, printers, scanners, that type of thing, um, and that's too much of a problem. And again, the prices for these two are the same, 999 for a 80 gig version and 1099 for 120 gigabyte version. Um, for those of you who would like to put um, 
and I want you to do it yourself, we are able to provide a DIY kit which includes the motherboard uh, and also includes graphics card, USB 2 card, obviously risk ls full instructions on the different um, uh, types of product that we recommend like floppy drives, hard drives, CD drives uh, so you can uh, buy those separately um, and also memory and things like that so if anybody's interested in putting together their own items and then the DIY kit uh, is available for you Right, I think that's probably um, apart from the fact that we're here um, and we've got machines for sale so do uh, by all means come along and um, see us and have a look uh, we also do a range of printers um, for those of you who have already got Ionix we are able to supply um, the ability to download a new ROM um, which we're also doing here at the show as well so if there's anything you want to do um, anything you would like to discuss with us come and um, see us on the stand um, up until now I've been oh I've got a question for that the laptop Where's the laptop? Where's the, where's the laptop? Um, before I answer that, I just want to explain a little bit about the structure. Um, um, at the moment, I'm talking to you about the product side of things. And uh, recently, we formed Ionix Limited, and all the computers and hardware and things like that are sold um, by Ionix Limited. Um, I'm also managing director of Castle Technology, which owns RISC-OS. But um, Castle is only interested in licensing risk OS. And so I'm going to, in a moment, uh, talk about um, uh, risk OS and what we're planning to do with that. Um, but I'll then put my Castle hat on. Um, as far as a laptop, um, it would be lovely to have a laptop. The, the age old problem with a laptop is, um, is actually the case, it's not the, necessarily the, the hardware. Um, uh, modern technology means that you've got to invest a huge amount of money, and I'm talking about large, large, large sums of money, uh, to produce the plastic case that a laptop will go in. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the problem then is that you have to do a large production run um, because it's a plastic case. So we're talking about many thousands of units, tens of thousands of units. So it's a big project. And the, the marketplace is, is not big enough for, for a business to take that risk. Um, the other way of doing it, and I think some people have already tried doing that, is taking a standard off-the-shelf um, uh, laptop case, uh, if you can. But most people like Samsung and Toshiba and Sony, they won't sell them to you anyway. Um, but even if you do find somebody, then the chances are by the time you've done the development, they change the case and, and they may very change it a little bit but it may mean that your board that you design just doesn't fit in so you can start all over again and I think that's probably where risk station you know ran into problems there I don't know uh, so it is a difficult problem so the, the best way of getting a laptop is for um, uh, going into um, business with a partner who wants to produce a risk OS laptop for whatever reason that, that's the way really it, it, it can work. So that doesn't say that there is a, a laptop around, and that is the reason why there isn't one around. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Oh, yes, gentlemen. Uh, to allow RISCOS 6 to just 32 to be produced for the Ionics? Um, right, I think I'm probably going to answer that question more or less in what I'm going to say now. So perhaps we can come back to that question at the end and see whether that you know, I've answered it or not. Is there anything, any other questions specifically about product side of things rather than RISCOS? Yes. What is the current situation regarding the use of the, the three solders and how it affects the Ionix in the future? 
Um, right, okay. Uh, it's a very good um, point. Um, in June this year, um, the EC uh, directed uh, to remove lead from the majority of um, products that use solar uh, was introduced, um, which does mean um, that uh, from the then on in, any new products that are actually produced uh, need to have uh, lead-free components. That's not strictly true, in fact, because there are certain uh, industrial areas where that doesn't apply, but it certainly applies in the home. Um, but it only applies to a uh, product that's actually manufactured, so motherboards, for instance, are manufactured after the end of June. So I don't think it was manufactured before the end of June. It's quite, um, uh, it can go through the system and come out the other end. But then obviously after that, um, there is an issue as to uh, uh, what you do. The engineering to actually move from lead-free, uh, from leaded uh, motherboards to lead-free is a relatively simple transition. Um, most of the components are available in lead, leaded and lead-free forms. So the simplest way of doing it is just to replace the components that you're using with the appropriate lead-free ones. Use lead-free solder and away you go. Um, it's not quite as simple as that because some of the products do actually um, disappear for various reasons. They become obsolete. And so there are minor more um, board changes that need to be done for most people who are moving from a leaded environment to a lead-free environment. Uh, but it's not, it's not um, a huge amount of work. Um, so, as far as um, the IOX PC is concerned, uh, once the current batch of uh, motherboards have gone through the system, uh, then there will be lead-free product um, available and it will just carry on as normal. There's no real issue at all. Can I answer the question? Any other questions? Oh. <laughs> Do you have some um, Oh, right. Yes, they've been noted, um, but you know what, what class is like. We don't like talking about future products <laughs> until we actually have them for sale. Um, but we're certainly uh, very much aware of uh, the new processes, um, quite exciting processes as well. Um, the gentleman asked the question that because we may have to do a redesign of the board, does that force us into a new product? I think that's what you were saying. Um, uh, possibly. That's all you can see. Any other questions? Right, gentleman at the back. Uh, by 12 in, back when 12 being released, and uh, you start the charge for it. Is, is this the start of charging for version 5? Right, okay. Did everybody have a question? Yeah. Um, uh, since we launched the Ionix, we haven't charged for any upgrades to Risk OS. We have actually got to the point. Um, where there have been some, uh, has been some major work, in, particularly on the graphics side of things, to introduce the complete range of NVIDIA cards rather than just the GeForce 2. And um, we, we've done other things as well. And it's also become a very stable uh, version of the operating system. Uh, because we haven't charged up until now, we feel we're quite justified to, to, to make a one-off charge for people should they wish uh, to um, put the new ROM in. It does have added uh, benefits, not only the graphics cards, it's got built in USB 2, um, and it has, uh, which does mean that in certain circumstances you'll get a faster, more reliable boot. So but there, there are benefits there. Um, we will continue um, to release versions of the operating system, um, and although we reserve the right to charge for them, um, the likelihood is that we will not charge for them as time goes by until another point in the future, um, so that you get the benefit. But when 5.13 comes out, for instance, um, it will only be available for those people who have gone to 5.12. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Will the new uh, release of risk costs and the cards 
finally go through them like pajamas. Um, with, with the new cars, it, it is much, much better. Um, we haven't seen any instances of it with the new cars, um, so we, we hope that that has gone away. But it's very difficult because we only have a limited range of um, cars actually uh, with us, and as we um, you know, as the take up goes out, we hope it's going to fill. It's not guaranteed to, but we hope it's going to fill all those problems. Right, I think uh, probably if you've got any more questions, save them for later. I'm going to move on now um, to talk a little bit about what's going on with Risk OS. Um, oh, seems right. Great. <laughs> just, just at the right moment. Come on up. Um, everybody, this is Steve Revel from um, Risk OS Open Limited. We'll just wire him up. I'm going to spend a few minutes just to talk to you a little um, I'll, come around, I'll come around this side. Is it going to ruin all the cameras at the moment? Right, we'll um, right, so where are we with Risk OS? As you know, Castle Technology owns Risk OS. Um, and we've done uh, obviously a lot of work with the Ionics, we've done a lot of work uh, through Tomatic, um, and we've done a lot of work elsewhere to try and get ViscoS used um, as, as an operating system of choice uh, throughout the world. Um, we've had various degrees of successes and some failures. Um, but what, what we did is we sat down and said, right, what are the key issues um, for ViscoS? Firstly, we want to have as many users as possible. The more users there are, and it doesn't matter how we do it, let's get users. There's more users there are, more developers there are, and hopefully that will build things up. Uh, we want to make it a worldwide um, product, not just a UK product. If you go overseas, if you go to Far East or something like that, and you try and explain what Risk OS is all about, it takes you, you know, a good half an hour just to tell people where Risk OS came from. Um, you know, and the language barrier as well, it actually makes it is a very difficult sales pitch. So we want to raise the profile, we want RiskOS to be known wherever you are in the world. Um, we want to speed up the development cycle, there's no point in uh, keeping everything under, you know, in, in a cupboard and working a little bit on it. Let's see if we can actually um, move things faster by making it more available. Um, and let, let's try and have a central um, main repository so that Risco actually comes out as one version for the future. So those are our aims. So how do we actually implement that? Um, the first thing is we must make uh, access uh, for Risco as easy as possible. We don't want people writing to us and then you know, signing licenses and then distributing software out to people. Uh, let's put it on a website Let's let, give it free access to people um, uh, and make it available as possible. In modern technology, there's no reason to all that do that. Um, when with an operating system, the key bits that are interesting to commercial exploiters of the operating system are the bits that they develop around the outside. The old stuff, the stuff that's in the middle, Okay, it may need to be tweaked and tuned as you go, but it's actually the IP that you create around the edges to make your product work that's important. Um, and those, uh, so you've got to develop that, and you either develop that in a, in a, a company um, environment or as a private individual for whatever reason. Um, so it's totally important that the developers, the people who are actually doing the engineering, writing the software, have free access to the source code. We want people to develop it, we don't want to stop them, we don't want to put anything in their way. So, um, but, what we don't want to do is just create an open free-for-all, because then we'll end up with lots of versions here, there and everywhere. Um, it, we need to have a central point where people are focused to. Not, we don't want to force people to go to a central point, but we want to make it um, a desirable way to do it, and Steve will talk more about that, that's in a working minute. Um, so the license structure that we developed, or developing, is free for personal use, so if you want to use RISC-OS, 
develop it, do whatever you want with it, and use it for your own private purposes, you can do that free. Okay? Um, however, if you're going to use it for a commercial product, in order to make money out of it, we'd like to have a little bit of that as well. And I'm talking this class now. We invested quite a lot of money in the purchase of Brisker S. Um, but, we're not, again, we're not going to make, put huge sums in people's way. It's going to be pence to license Risk-OS. So we're going to try and remove all the obstacles to actually licensing Risk-OS. Uh, so it's a no-brainer for people. Um, and the most important thing, by the way that we structured the dual license scheme, so it's free for developers and for, um, uh, uh, and, and for developers, um, it does, uh, but they pay a license fee, a small license fee, uh, for commercial use. But it, they are going to be allowed to keep their IP, which is substantially different from uh, the Linux world, where you create a bit of software using some Linux code, then you have to make it available. And that does put a, um, a clamp on uh, development. Um, so, um, quick look at the time scales. Um, there's a lot of work involved, Steve talked about this, and so there'll be a gradual release of uh, the source code. And we'll start with things like browse, ceiling, one build, uh, all these um, uh, excellent bits of software. And then, you know, as weeks, months go by, more and more stuff will come out. Um, and we hope to get those initial releases uh, out and about within uh, just a few weeks. Um, um, we're going we're to get to the point where you can actually um, build a complete, for instance, Ionix uh, ROM. So the whole of the operating system is going to be available. Um, there, are, there are small limited parts, and they're very, very small. They won't be available because um, uh, the traditional, uh, well, the, the, the license conditions attached to them uh, prevent us from actually um, putting them out as shared source. But they're, they're very small, and uh, most of them are significant uh, parts. Right? But you will be able to build a, a, an Ionix ROM. And you may ask, well, if you can build an Ionix ROM, what are Ionix limited you know, get out of this? But of course, what we specialize in is building the motherboard. And to build a motherboard is a, is a huge investment. It, it takes a lot of time and money um, to build it, um, and there's specialist reasons for having it. So that's the thing that we're going to, and I am going to be concentrating on. And, um, you know, yes, we're going to use risk um, uh, but if somebody wants to go out and build their own Ionics, you've got to design another board uh, and everything else, so it's quite a lot of work. Uh, but there's no reason why it shouldn't. And going back to the starting slide there, what we want to do is get as many users as possible. So rather than lock it in a cupboard, we're going to put it on a website and let, hopefully get people to go off. Uh, and develop it. And what's going to happen is there's going to be a little brisk OS community that slowly develops around the website. Um, and when we go and talk to people in the Far East or America or whatever it is, um, you know, they'll be able to log on to the risk OS open website and they'll be able to see what's going on, see what drivers there are, they'll be able to download software, they'll be able to do their engineering, and you know, it's going to be a much easier job actually selling risk OS and risk OS technology you know, to everybody in the world. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, why we're doing what we're doing. Um, I think I've probably already explained, but let's just go through it again. Carlton Technology Limited owns RISC-OS, and it um, wants RISC-OS used by as many people as possible. Ionix Limited uh, sells computer hardware, and RISC-OS Open Limited, Steve, uh, provide access to RISC-OS. They're also going to provide um, other services as well. So I think what I'll do is I'll hand over to Steve and he can tell you a little bit more detail what's been going on. And then we'll both be here to answer any questions. Thank you, Steve. Hi everyone, as Jack said earlier, I'm Steve Reynolds and uh, I'm a freelance software engineer and I'm here representing RISCOS Open Limited. And I'll tell you a little bit about our company first of all. It's formed by five people, four of whom are ex Acorn and ex Pace, and we've been through the whole the whole uh, evolution of uh, risk OS. Um, there's me and a guy called Andrew Hodgkinson and Ben Anderson, 
and we were engineers, software engineers at Acorn. And this guy called Richard Nickel, who is uh, an ex-manager of the Pace Cambridge division, and this guy called Andrew Moyler, who is someone we've worked with for a number of years. And we've been speaking to Castle for quite a long time about the possibility of opening up access to the sources of risk ice, because we're strong believers that the best way to move risk ice forward in the future is through a community approach. And so we've had a long period of discussion and trying to agree the best way to do it. And I think now we've come up with a solution that's going to work. Uh, so risk ice open have formed to be a central kind of interface onto the software sources and a focal point for the community to grow around. Uh, we're going to have uh, forums and false database for risk ice and we're going to have wiki for documentation and PRMs eventually. And basically we want everyone to be able to get hold of sources either as archived up tar holes or as through the CDS repository and build their own versions of risk ice into their own products. That possibly might mean they'll soft load a risk ice ROM into the emulator, say RM or RPCM. Um, or you might just want to build a new ROM for your Ionix and soft load that. That should be fine. But as Jack was saying earlier, it is quite a big job because historically the source tree for risk ice has had a lot of um, comments and bits and bobs. There's loads of input from third parties that's under different license conditions, so it's quite hard work working our way through it and figuring out what we can release and what we can't release. Um, but we're getting there. We've, we've chosen a set of software that a lot of people have asked us about over the years um, to release initially. Not, not least of which is a printer stack, the whole thing stack from the drivers up to the front end because there's a lot of improvements we feel that people can make straight away. Um, so those, those are being opened up. And there's a browser uh, known as Browse or Phoenix, and there's some associated modules with that which we think are generally useful for people to put in their public domain software. So they should be able to do that free of charge. And if you write any commercial software, as Jack was saying, the barriers to using risk ice sources or risk ice binaries in your commercial software are quite low now because all you have to do is pay a royalty per unit to Castle and then you can go ahead and do it. So we're hoping that that's going to be uh, widely adopted by all sorts of people. Um, there's not much else I can say about risk ice open at this point other than that we're doing this as, as a part-time activity really. Um, so we've been asking for volunteers in the community especially people who have good understanding of uh, sources and developers if they want to volunteer their efforts to opening up the sources then they're more than welcome so uh, I think we should open to all the questions Hi How are you going to uh, avoid duplication effort between yourselves and the risk of community? For example, there must have been a lot of work done on risk of certain southern areas, and a lot of work done on risk of and other areas that would be perfectly wasteful to simply you know, try and duplicate. Yeah, I think it's a question of how much the work would benefit people. Um, even if Risk Ice Limited have done some work, say, updated uh, paint, the application, then if that's never going to be available through Risk Ice Limited on the Ionics, then I still think it's worthwhile opening up the sources to paint and letting people add features to the Risk Ice 5 version or the shared source version, uh, even if it is effectively a duplication of development effort. I think it's still beneficial because then it's available to the whole community rather than just select subscribers. But also we welcome um, Risk Us Limited to come along and join in with this activity and maybe feed some of their sources into the global repository and then uh, we'll all benefit from their development. Yeah, sorry, I'd like to add to what Steve just said. Um, 
Uh, we have in the past tried to work with this possibility, but unfortunately it hasn't worked. Um, we can't really do much more than making all our test sources available to everybody, whoever they are, risk cost limited included. Um, so, you know, we're doing as much as we can, it's really over to them. If there's a duplicate of effort, then there's nothing we can do about that, unfortunately. Well, one question about the way is that this has paid such a small community, um, people who contributed to the things that this has limited may well be contributing to the open source, so you don't need to go back to the people that you know. Can I just ask you a question? Is it me or can I? That's a very important question. Sorry. What's your request is the most important community. Yeah. So people who have contributed to what this has limited to be able to address Maybe the same people contributing to the open source issue, so it might get sorted anyway, without having to pay you to We We hope that uh, ultimately um, it would just be the sensible way of doing it. Um, there are a lot of operating systems now that are open source, and, and you know, they, they've developed very, very fast. The development curve is like that for things like Linux. Now, um, by making open source um, available, um, risk is available in a similar way, not the same way. Uh, we hope that that ultimately uh, will be the case. Um, it will take a little while for everybody to find where they're best working. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's the new developments that you do around the edge of risk OS that, that give you something that you can actually sell. And we want, so if risk OS put a new, uh, or anybody puts a new feature in, they have every right to exploit that. Um, and make some money out of it. We all have to make money somewhere along the line because we've all got to, you know, go out and buy food and you know, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, the mechanisms are there to do it. Um, but the important thing is, how do we make risk arrests? Um, how do we make the, um, the distribution of risk arrests better for everybody? And we feel this is the right way to do it. One thing I would like to add is um, one of the things we're planning for the website is sorry, I just moved this mic. One of the things planning for the website is to have a forum where people can discuss not only risk as general issues, but suggestions of what they might want to develop and what they might want to change, and then people can discuss that openly and say, "Well, I don't think that's a worthwhile use of your time." and everyone in the community can kind of come to some consensus about whether something's worth doing or not. And then uh, that's hopefully another mechanism to avoid pointless duplication of effort. But I think most of the effort will be beneficial. You said that this was going to be done as a part-time activity by Riscos Open Limited. I wondered if you could possibly indicate how much development is being done by Castle and also whether Peter Wilde is back on board flying around the Far East trying to sell it. Oh, um, right. Okay, well, I'll ask a bit about um, um, Pete. Pete is very much uh, on board. Um, Car Castle itself is, you know, is, is concentrating on making sure there's a channel for risk OS out. Uh, we want other people um, to um, use risk OS and there's lots of people within the risk cost community, um, the directors of Castle included, of which of course Peter is one, uh, who will be doing their bit in their own way to actually um, make sure that risk OS gets used as much as possible. Um, we've all been involved, I certainly been involved with risk OS since you know, the uh, late 80s, and uh, we all believe strongly in it. Um, so yeah, it, it's going to be promoted by the way. very much so. As far as Castle doing any development itself, um, that's probably unlikely. Um, we, want, uh, we want to devolve all of that out uh, to people who want to do the development work for their particular products. Um, it may be that, that Castle does do something sometimes, uh, but um, it depends, because there's so, there's so many marketplaces where you can use RISC-OS. Um, you know, we can't predict 
where that's going to be. Um, people have ideas for new products. There's a whole generation of ARM chips, you know, doing all sorts of strange things for all sorts of applications. And Risk OS is ideal for any of those. So, um, you know, it's much better to let the people at Coalface, the people who are actually selling the products, work out what they need to do. Any more questions? Yes. Have you thought of having a subscription scheme to force users to make a decision as to which way I vote with their money, which way they would like to see risk of risk develop? Um, no. No, I think um, uh, Steve and his team are, are certainly looking for donations to help cover the costs of running uh, risk loss open initiative. So, you know, who mm -hmm. the access to servers and all, all the costs that are involved. Um, um, whether a subscription scheme is sensible, well, we have, we have discussed it actually at various points. Um, uh, if we could ask developers, for instance, for a subscription for access to the sources, but you know, we felt that it's important that those people who, from the, the guy who just loves Risco X and wants to do some stuff in his room, you know, every evening when he gets back from work, uh, right through to the, uh, the company uh, who's using Risco, wants to use Risco S for a multi-million pound project, it's important that they all have free access. Let's put no barriers in their way. Let's make it as simple as possible for them to get that. And, you know, the guy in his bedroom may not have a lot of money, so why should he have to pay anything? And the company, okay, yes, it has lots of money, but then how much do you charge? So we've decided that the only time that we're actually going to definitely ask for money is if you use it in a commercial product. But even then, it's not going to be very much. I suppose there's a question there about how is risk is open limited expecting to make any money? Because that's part of the question. No, the real question is about making sure developers don't have to develop more than one machine, more than one right. operating system. Yeah. In other words, getting, getting the operating system back together into one form. Right. Well, uh, we'll have to see where Bristol's Limited decides to go with that, but certainly the, op the opening up of the sources, that particular source tree should be able to build on multiple machines. It should be able to build the risk of uh, the risk PC version and the A9 version. That, that should be fine. So there should be no reason to, to not be able to target a certain platform with the sources that are opened up. I think it's also important to realise that there are actually lots of other risk OS devices um, you know, all around, all over the world. And, um, you know, There are different versions of RISC OS. There's RISC OS uh, 3, there's RISC OS 3.11, there's RISC OS 3.7, there's RISC OS 4, there's RISC OS 5, there might be RISC OS 6, you know, and, and there are other versions elsewhere doing other things. Some things work, some things don't work. But I think the important thing is, for, for, as far as sort of things like the APIs are concerned, if they're freely available, they're well documented, they're available to all developers, then we can't do any more. Than, than, than that, and we hope that ultimately um, that will be um, something that um, people like RiskOS will fit into, rather than trying to sort of reinvent the, the book, because they, they can have as much input as they like uh, into everything. Um, there will be, Steve and some of his chums will be uh, making sure that it's done sensibly, and there's always good reasons for doing things and not doing things. Castle isn't going to be actively developing. 513, 514, are they going to have to come from this work they were talking about? Um, right, so uh, let's take the example of, of the Ionics development. Um, any work that we do, um, if we, so I've got my Ionics Limited hat on now, if possible. Uh, any work that we do, 
uh, we will um, ultimately feed back into the source tree. We may not do it for a period of time, because we want to make some money out of it, um, which we have to do, obviously, to keep the bulk company going. Um, but it is in our interests to put that back into the pool. Because let's say we do, um, let's say we do a firewire driver. Okay, we might want to hang on to that code for six months, um, make some money out of it, um, and then put it back into the open, uh, the open source, the shared source, um, so that other people can use it. And then other people will develop you know, add-ons to go on to the firewire core, for instance, or, or module, um, and that will be to our benefit. Yeah? So, and then there's, a, there's no benefit after you've actually developed something and, and hanging on and keeping it to yourself. You might just as well let somebody else benefit from it. And hopefully those, the other people will have the same attitude. And so you get small developments and, and going forward and it feeds back into the general pool. So that when, you know, we for instance want to do another motherboard and it's got firewire built in on the motherboard, for instance, um, then we can, you know, use that code. And so everything goes forward. So it's a different way of looking at it. It takes a little while to actually see how it can work. Um, but there are benefits for everybody along the line. But the most important thing is to develop this risk OS um, core. Does that answer the question? Okay. Okay. I'm not sure how we're doing for time, but I'm not watching that. What a pass. Well, I think probably, um, that's probably it, Steve. We don't have anything else to say. Um, Steve and I will be here for a, for a while, so please, if you want to come and have a private chat, uh, come see us now or, or come over to the uh, stand. Um, thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.